You can see here, this is a native bunch grass that has very deep roots. This is a, a bush lupin, again, very deep roots. Even these smaller bunch grasses have deep roots. This, you can barely see it, this is the annual introduced grass. Very shallow roots. Welcome to a crash course in California field botany. I'm your host, Skylar Thomas. This is an actual crash course for me, but fortunately for you and me, I have an actual expert, Laura Cunningham, who's going to help us out. I'm sitting in a field in Northern California and I'm surrounded by wild oats and hair barley and other plants that aren't native. The significance being that these were introduced from Europe, mainly due to agriculture, cattle grazing. Why is that significant? Because cattle grazing is being presented as a fire suppressant that we need to keep grazing the cattle in order to stop these terrible burns that we have in California. Once again, I'm faced with a case of receiving conflicting information. So how do I know what's what? Well, I'm not an ecologist or a botanist, so I'm gonna dumb it down because you're probably not an ecologist or a botanist either. So let's just use our eyes and think about what makes the most sense. Using just the visual information that your eyes are providing, what would you choose of these three as the biggest fire hazard? The trees in the background, the houses, or this field up front. I know that's almost condescendingly simple, but it does set the stage for the topic. Several months ago, I was on a guided field tour of Point Reyes National Seashore with Laura Cunningham and learned a lot about plants that I didn't know before. Several months later, I was driving out to Point Reyes again and noticed that the hills were already starting to turn brown. But when I actually got into Point Reyes, particularly in the elk reserve, the vegetation was still largely green. Why? Does this tie into the argument about uh, fire suppression also? It could because the um, when you get rid of some of the coastal prairie grasses that are green well into the summer, they are less flammable than these flashy annual grasses that dry out very quickly after the winter rains. So yeah, you, you definitely have a, a fire problem with the flashy, weedy, sometimes noxious weeds like dried stems of poison hemlock and thistle, which the cows don't eat. There's quite a lot of this dried material out there, which could be a fire hazard. If we restored these areas back to coastal prairie, there would be a lot less fire hazard. It would be lusher and greener into the summer. Tule elk would be grazing these lightly. It would be just a much more natural community to have out in a national park unit. Something important to consider is that unlike where I grew up, where there were thunderstorms in the hot summer, in California, it's dry during the summer. So you have a combination of the heat and a lack of water. Unless we assume that California was burning its entire history and was just a fire hazard forever, we might consider that perhaps there were plants here that had adjusted to that type of a climate. All right, so let's put this theory to the test. I am now out on my own. I'm walking through an area of Northern California that was affected by the fires last year, and it's reasonable to suspect that it will be affected again. What I'm going to do is attempt to identify the plants that I see and figure out the ratio of natives to invasives. Okay, here we go. Laura's guess was that this was a native plant called sticky tarweed, but she wasn't sure until it bloomed, but it sure is sticky. She got that part right. And she said it would smell like lemon vinegar. It has a very particular smell. I don't know if that's what lemon vinegar smells like, but maybe. I come in closer to this big guy. I got some clues here that this is actually an oak tree, which produced acorns, which was a staple food of California natives. And oak trees are resilient to drought conditions. Makes sense that that's what's here. All right, so we got some brush in here and we got some poison hemlock mixed in there. Turns out this was poison oak, so don't touch it the way that I do here. 
But the leaves are good for deer and the berries are good for birds. And once again, the Native Americans made use of this for medicinal purposes. This is yellow star thistle. It is invasive, native to Eurasia, and introduced to the United States via South America in 1850. Sheep sorrel is also not native to here, and once again is from Eurasia. It is toxic. We shouldn't eat it. Cattle will graze on it, but it's even toxic to them in large quantities. Old radish is also not native, an invasive habitat threatening species. I never figured out what this grass was, and I didn't figure out what the other grass was either. Scarlet Pimpernel is once again an invasive species. This again is from Europe. The most common dandelions were introduced from Europe and now propagate as wildflowers. Once again, not native. Wild mustard is a non-native annual noxious weed. Sticky monkey flower is native and is perennial and was used by Native Americans. Mixed in here and dominating the land, we have hedgehog, dogtail grass, wild oats, and hair barley. All of them are non-native. All of them are highly flammable. All of them were introduced for livestock or other agriculture. This is bull thistle. When it is dry in the summer, it is highly combustible and it is invasive and now found in all 50 states. And poison hemlock is a highly poisonous biennial plant, once again, invasive. Although the plant is green at the time of this filming, it turns brown by the summer's end and the brown seeds are extremely flammable. From that short walk, how many plants did you count that were listed as native versus introduced? And how many of those that were introduced were introduced from Europe for the sake of agriculture? Keeping in mind that it is now July, go back to that list and think about how many of those plants were still green and which of those plants had already turned brown and dead. I used the word biennial and also perennial and annual, so we might as well talk about those. Biennial means it takes two years to complete its life cycle, whereas an annual completes its life cycle in one year, from seed to fully grown back to seed. So it grows, turns brown, burns up, or gets trampled, or returns to the soil, whereas a perennial lasts for many seasons. Perennial native plants are helpful in many ways, not the least of which is the fact that since it lasts for several seasons, it can actually provide a home for other animals that want to use it for shelter, or that want to use food from it, or that want to hide in it, even live in it, or perhaps those animals even benefit that plant. Let's talk more about the native oak trees. I already mentioned how the Native Americans use the ac acorns as a staple food and that the oak tree is highly drought resistant, which is fantastic, but their branches are also horizontally reaching and they provide incredible shade, shelter, homes, and a very strong root system to fight erosion. The poison oak, also native and perennial, Although the leaves change throughout the year, you can see that it is basically much more fire resistant than some of these annual plants. And because it's there all year round, it can also provide shelter. Black-tailed deer, mule deer, California ground squirrels, western gray squirrels, and other indigenous fauna feed on the leaves of the plant. And bird species use the berries for food and utilize the plant structure for shelter. Native animals, nor horses or livestock or canine pets, have the same reactions that we do. Native Americans used the plant's stems and shoots to make baskets, the sap to cure ringworm, and as a poultice of fresh leaves applied to rattlesnake bites. So although we don't like the allergic reaction, it's actually a very useful plant. And apparently I'm immune to it because I was touching the heck out of it. Now although the tarweed isn't perennial, it is native, and after reading about it, it's extremely interesting. I've got to share some things. I mentioned that it was sticky and that it had that scent. It was a staple to the Pomo Indians who ate its seeds for protein. Tarweeds are immensely drought tolerant, beautiful, smell lovely, provide natural chemical free pest control, feed birds, protect pollinators, and much more. Here's the final score, which I think is kind of sad because the natives just got their butts kicked. I counted four. There might be more out there, but that's how many I found just taking that walk. By comparison, I had 11 non-natives on that same walk. Again, there may have been more, but that's how many I saw just on that quick walk. Now, if I add a column here, the big picture starts to come together. Of the few natives we had, most of them were perennial. 
and even the non-perennial native was ranked as highly drought resistant and extremely useful. With the introduced plants, none of them were perennial. You don't have to be perennial to be a useful plant, but in this particular case you can see a clear correlation that the non-perennials have a tendency to be much more combustible, a higher fire risk. By now you've probably figured out that a major takeaway from this lesson is that the invasive plants are more prone to fire. How much of an advantage would it be to return this area back to its native flora? Reducing fire hazard isn't the only advantage of bringing back the native plants. This shows this poster. This is actually of the Great Basin, but it is very parallel to our coastal prairie at Point Reyes National Seashore. And you can see here, this is a native bunch grass that has very deep roots. This is a, a bush lupin, again, very deep roots. Even these smaller bunch grasses have deep roots. This, you can barely see it, this is the annual introduced grass, very shallow roots. And so most of the Point Reyes pastoral zone has been converted from this to this, these annual grasses. And this is not carbon farming. When you have cattle overgraze these and you mow these bush lupins and you get rid of these deep roots and then it's all converted to this. This is why we have so much erosion and siltation of streams, which is bad for coho salmon. But when you have all of this as the pastoral zone, shallow roots not holding the soil together, this is not good carbon farming. We want this. We want the whole park to look like this. I mean, it's a huge amount more if you restored the native grasses that would do far more than carbon farming. Exactly. Thank you. That's so there. That's my opinion. But. What we want then is for the the studies that the state is funding to account for all the impacts then. So we can get to all this. Yeah. You think the setup of the studies is great? Yeah. The seven hundred fifty thousand dollars grant. Yeah. Uh, that's a shame. This road was cleared away recently to make a convenient path for humans and gives an opportunity to look at the root structure here and how minimal it is. Talk about easy erosion. system. Carbon farm that. Obviously they're very shallow. They're easy to pull up. And by comparison, I tried to pull up one of the bunch grasses out at Point Reyes. I mean, I anchored my feet into the ground, squatted, and used my whole body, and the plant laughed at me. I mean, it didn't even budge. There's a pretty good indicator of the roots. But a strong root system and reducing fire hazards still aren't the only advantages. Having native uh, coastal prairies and diverse north coastal sage scrub and other native habitats would benefit native species, rare species, birds. It would benefit um, elk. It would also benefit salmon because you'd have less erosion if you have a, a coastal prairie that's not trampled and overgrazed by cattle, you would have much less runoff and erosion, which silts up coho salmon streams and is really a, a contributor to their decline. Why don't elk eradicate those plants the way that cattle do? Elk are much smaller than dairy and even beef cows. I mean, they're almost half the size an adult elk. A tule elk is half the size of a beef or dairy cow, especially the large dairy cows, which can be 1,400 pounds. Elk are 300 to maybe 800 pounds maximum, probably more like 500 pounds at point raise. They have a smaller muzzle, so they're much more selective when they are grazing on grasses, wildflowers, shrubs, than cows, which uh, have a very broad muzzle and are generalist grazers. They'll just take everything like lawnmowers. So having a 
well-managed elk herd would be very beneficial for native habitats in Point Reyes. They just don't do as much damage. They don't trample, they don't overgraze if they're managed well. And right now the cows are not managed well because there are too many of them in this small area of Point Reyes. There's so many cows that they have to, the, the ranchers have to import, truck in alfalfa by the ton, by the truckload, and grow silage, which is a form of hay mostly made of rye, wheat, mustard, radish, and like a domestic pea that is cut and harvested and then fed to the, the dairy cows, which need a lot of calories. And this props up this artificially high stocking rate for dairy cows. You would never have that many tule elk in Point Reyes because they would not be artificially supplemented with this rich feed and hay. So if we could have native elk and coastal prairies and north coastal sage scrub ecosystems, it would be a much more balanced um, picture out there in this park. So there you have it. Whether you care about the native animals, the native habitat, or you just don't want your house to burn down, the advantages of returning the native plants seem overwhelming. Thank you, Laura Cunningham, for my lesson, which led to my first crash course in California field botany. I hope everyone learned a lot.